Today in Memo to the President, the topic is revitalize the international security system for the 21st century. Hello, I'm Gigi Hinton, along with Carlos Pascual, Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy here at Brookings and author of the memo. Carlos, you write that no nation, including the United States, can face the international, transnational challenges of global poverty, of terrorism, of nuclear proliferation, of climate change, and the collapsing economy alone. Right. You say now is the time for us to build partnerships which would strengthen America's leadership and at the same time strengthen its security. So what's the situation? The situation is that on all of these problems, they don't understand borders. And regardless as much as we want to say that borders are sacrosanct and we can actually control what goes in and out of them, we can't. It doesn't matter what we do on our own with that last unit of carbon and whether it crosses into the United States. It doesn't matter what we do on our own to control nuclear proliferation. We need to work together with a network of other countries. And so what we've come to find is that American security is based on working together with others. But what we've also learned is that American leadership in this kind of environment can't depend on unilateral action. It's based on building international partnerships. And so it's that change in perspective on our security and it's a change in perspective on what leadership means that is so critical today. And to that end, President-elect Obama has said that the United States is strongest when it stands next to strong partners. Mm -hmm. Now, how is, can this be manifested in his, his terms? It's one of the hardest challenges as well to face, and I think that this is one of the big issues that President Obama is going to face in his new administration. First and foremost, he's going to face an agenda in 2009, which is absolutely fast and furious. He's going to have a G20 summit on economics in April. He's going to have uh, a NATO summit in April. He's going to have a non-proliferation conference in May. He's going to have another meeting of the G8 in July. There's a major climate change conference at the end of the year. And on each of those questions, one of the things that everyone is struggling with is, how do you restructure the economic system in order to make it representative and more effective? How do you get greater scrutiny of better performance, yet at the same time made, maintain some form of stability in the international system? And so there are going to need to be changes in the IMF and in the World Bank and how they function. There are going to need to be changes in how, how the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty functions and what kinds of assurances are given to states that are seeking civilian nuclear power. But as part of that, the United States and Russia are going to have to reduce their nuclear arsenals as well to build up confidence. There's going to have to be a new framework that is developed for dealing with climate change. All of these are things that have to happen in 2009, and if the, United, if the United States wants to be relevant to it, President Obama is going to have to give direction very early on to his team on how to relate to that extraordinarily complicated agenda on these issues. Thank you, Carlos. It's a pleasure. And if you would like to read this paper in its entirety, please visit our website, www.brookings.edu, and you can read it there. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. I think that President-elect Obama can make us safer at home by continuing to talk and have negotiations with other countries, both um, hostile countries and countries we're allied with. The best thing that we can be as a country is be hospitable, um, safe and secure, but also hospitable and to project that image that we as Americans are really great people to know. I think we should uh, treat, for example, the United Nations with more respect. And uh, instead of taking actions uh, more unilaterally, we should be taking them more multilaterally um, and sort of taking advantage of uh, uh, the power of international consensus through the UN. And that's what I think. Hello, I'm David Mark with Politico, here today with Stephen Hess, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of What Do We Do Now? A workbook for the president-elect. Hello, Steve. <laughs> We're nearing the end of the seemingly long transition period. We've got uh, confirmations coming up in the next few days or so. The one that seems the most potentially troublesome for President-elect Barack Obama is Eric Holder, his designee for attorney general. Will Mr. Holder be the sacrificial lamb of sort that we've seen in the past few administrations? <laughs> well, there always seems to be one. 
uh, and it's as if uh, it's a tradition. It, it's the Senate, it's Article 1 of the Constitution reminding Article 2, the executive, that we're we're a co-equal branch of government, and we, we want to show you exactly uh, how you have to squirm a little. <laughs> and, uh, and by and large, the, the, the nominee does a little groveling uh, and gets through. Rare, but it happens sometimes that he doesn't get through, and that's often enough uh, to, uh, to remind people that this is serious business. <laughs> Turning our attention to the inaugural itself, mm -hmm. just uh, coming up in a very short amount of time, mm -hmm. how should President-elect Obama proceed which, with his speech in terms of how substantive should he be? Should he have a laundry list of policy oh, ideas, oh, no. or should it be more general? Oh, sure. This, uh, the, the gold standard was John Kennedy, 12 minutes. Uh, if he goes more than 15 minutes, it will be noted. So you're talking about a very short address. Uh, so you say, hey, what can you say in, uh, in 12 minutes? Well, pick a theme. Uh, <laughs> go back to why you got elected. I wouldn't say remind people what you'd like on a bumper sticker. But nevertheless, it's the same sort of thing. One message uh, is probably the, uh, the, what a president-elect has to do. Are there any inaugural uh, speeches in your experience in history that went on too long and probably did not accomplish what the new president hoped to? Well, uh, Barack Obama, in a sense, doesn't really have to worry. Most inaugural addresses haven't been very good. <laughs> Only about a half a dozen are really memorable. And the one that was least memorable was William, Howard Ta uh, William uh, Henry Harrison. Uh, and he went on and on and on and on. It was in the rain. He caught the flu. He died shortly thereafter. Uh, so um, the shortest one, of course, was George Washington. It was only less than 200 words. Uh, so I think um, if, if he thinks of FDR, the only th have, uh, thing we have to fear is fear itself, the, the most comparable moment, 1933, or, of course, the two Lincoln ones, which were glorious ones. And, of course, he cares so much about Lincoln. He'll have some really good models. President-elect Obama stirred some controversy when he selected Pastor Rick Warren to deliver the invocation, mm -hmm. opening up the ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Was this a good move, an unwise move? Did this set the wrong tone? Or what, what's your read on it? Well, it, it's, it's interesting that even who you pick for your pastors makes a difference. Uh, and usually these inaugural uh, events uh, give a... Uh, a president-elect a chance to pick four faiths. <laughs> you know? If it's a, a pro often Protestant, white, and, and black, Catholic, Jewish, never been a Muslim <laughs> uh, picked yet. Uh, so this was notable. People noticed uh, because, of course, uh, this was a, uh, a pastor uh, who had strong views uh, on, uh, on homosexuality, uh, and particularly uh, in California where there had been a serious uh, referendum. So uh, it was controversial. Clearly, uh, Ob uh, Obama understood it was controversial, so he knew what he was doing. <laughs> We're out of time for today. Thank you very much. Be a part of the presidential transition. Join our pundits and experts for The Scouting Report, our live web chat every Wednesday afternoon at 1230. Log on to www.brookings.edu transition.